和政治衰败等新著。他的思想引发政治学界无数争论，他的理论历经脏批，但他的名字却从未淡出公众的视野。他便是美国政治学家、斯坦福大学政治学教授弗朗西斯·福山。福山做客《思想无间道》。从他的新书《政治秩序和政治衰败》出发，畅谈现代治理体系中的民主、国家和法律。Well, good morning, Frank, and welcome to、uh, Guan Cha.、Um, and first, I want to congratulate you for、uh, the publication of your, the second volume of your books,、um, "Political Order and Political Decay."、Uh, the first volume, "The Origin of Political Order." Which talk about the history of political systems from the very beginning, from the Darwinian beginning <laughs> to the French Revolution, and and the second uh, is a, a, from from that point to globalization.、Um, I must confess, the first book、uh, was very long, and I suffered through it, <laughs> and I resolved at that point not to read the second volume, <laughs> but I couldn't help myself, and I read it anyway.、Um, so, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you、um, very much. And and I think it、um, would be very useful for our readers、um, and our、uh, viewers, possibly, to、uh, for you to first、uh, give us a sense of the state of democracy in America,、uh, if, if you will.、Um, you 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 spend quite a bit. I mean, it's not going to be the focus of this particular talk,、mm-hmm. uh, but. Uh, let's start there,、mm-hmm. and, and and let's have your analysis of the state of the political system in America, and what are the risks and challenges that America faces,、uh, which you talk at length、uh, in your book.、Uh, well, thank you very much,、uh, Eric.、Um, I think right now the United States is going through a very challenging period in its history because. The political system is very polarized between the two political parties, Republicans and Democrats.、Uh, this is something that's been building for a long time.、Uh, there's a lot of partisan uh, rancor, uh, which has result resulted in political gridlock. It's very hard、uh, for Americans to make decisions on immigration, which has been a big issue recently, or even something as basic as the budget because、and、of healthcare. healthcare Uh, because of these uh, disagreements,、uh, this is something that the American system has gone through periodically in the past.、Uh, and one of the big questions I think for the future is: Will American democracy be self-correcting? Because I think、um, you know, with the group, of, with the rise of money in politics and special interests, uh, uh, you should have a, a democratic system where ordinary people will rise up and. You know, throw the、right. the rascals out.、Right. Uh, it hasn't happened uh, uh, recently, and you know that's one of the big challenges I think for for American politics right now. Yeah. So I, I think the、uh, interesting point, which I read in your book, and of course in the last couple of decades from、uh, political scientists like Mansur Olson,、uh, which is the the point about interest groups,、mm-hmm. and and I think Olson calls them distributive coalitions,、um, and and you. Coined the term "bitocracy,"、mm-hmm. uh, which means that interest groups accumulate power over a long period of time, and they become distributive coalitions, and、mm-hmm. then they capture the political system and、mm-hmm. hold it hostage.、Uh, so, in order for something to happen, every subgroup、mm-hmm. has to be satisfied, and、mm-hmm. every subgroup acts in its own narrow interest instead of the collective good,、uh, and that's what's. That is what's the, the ill of the、mm-hmm. current system at the moment.、Mm-hmm. I mean, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, this is a broader phenomenon、yeah. that I label political decay,、mm-hmm. uh, where you have well-organized、uh, interest groups that capture, as you say, the, the political system.、Uh, I don't think that this is a unique province of、um, democracies.、Right. Uh, I think this can happen in any political system. So, for example,、uh, in the first volume that you found. Uh, very long and hard、yeah. to get through. There's a you know a long chapter on on ancient China. Yes. And at the end of the later Han Dynasty,、uh, you had this phenomenon where the regime was was captured by elite families. Right. And this is something that went on for the next 300 years. You know, in the period of the Three Kingdoms and、yeah. uh, and so forth. And then it was the the, the more impersonal Chinese system was then restored. You know, in in later. Dynasties, and so it's a it's a cycle that that countries go through. I think in the United States,
uh, right now, it's become problematic because interest groups are extremely well funded. Uh, our Supreme Court has said that essentially money in politics is a form of free speech that's protected by the First Amendment, uh, which I think is a mistaken interpretation of the Constitution, but that's what the court has said. And so, um, you know, you have Wall Street, for example, that uh, has you know, a very large concentration of money uh, and, you know, they can block things that, right. that are harmful to themselves. And I think that's a really big uh, issue now. Which view terms vitocracy. Uh, and so we have a system of checks and balances that makes it relatively easy for one part of the political system to block other parts of the political system. And uh, I think that's, uh, you know, that's um, at the heart of what I call vitocracy, meaning, you know, it's, it's rule by veto. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, another uh, concept that you elaborated on in the book, which I found is the first time I ever really uh, 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 studied this, is the judicialization of political mm -hmm. governance. Um, so sort of every judge is making policies. Mm -hmm. um, would you sort of give a sense of that? Because I think that would be new uh, mm -hmm. to our readers mm -hmm. and our, uh, our viewers. Well, there are many administrative functions that in, and, and by the way, this is a uniquely American problem. Right. It's not a problem European. that exists in many European uh, democracies. But in the United States, we have this very strong tradition of common law that comes from England. So law was really the first um, institution that was established way right. before um, uh, uh, the colonies were independent of Britain and there was democracy or anything else. Uh, and uh, it means that judges in this system have actually a lot of policy making uh, power. So, for example, the legalization of abortion, right. which in other democracies was done by the legislature, uh, in the United States was really done by the a decision of the, of the courts. Yeah. And in the ordinary enforcement of law, uh, uh, ordinary Americans actually have the right uh, to sue uh, the government to either enforce a law or to pre prevent the government from enforcing a law right. in a way that just doesn't exist in, uh, in other countries. Right. Um, and so this is one of the respects in which I think the courts have taken over functions that are more properly played by the executive branch or by an administrative uh, agency. Right. Yeah, for instance, in California, we, we had mm -hmm. this conversation that the, the, the high-speed rail project, mm -hmm. uh, Governor Brown's high-speed rail project, has more than 200 lawsuits mm -hmm. on it. I mean, that, that, that would be a part of that. That's right, and that's what makes a lot of infrastructure projects. It delays them and, and, and makes them more expensive because of the ability of private individuals to, to sue. Yeah. Now, you know, according to Mentor Olson, when a political system is captured by distributive coalitions, there is always almost no solution to it. You, you're basically stuck short of a revolution or some kind of external shock. Um, so how do we... How, how does the system get out of that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean the, the revolutions and external shocks are not, mm -hmm. not welcome phenomena yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Um, so how do we, if, if a system is indeed captured by distributive coalitions and it is ossified that way, how, mm -hmm. how do you break out of that? I mean, what, what kind of reforms for instance, what does America need, mm -hmm. political reforms does America need uh, to get beyond this, if, if ever? Well, I think that uh, sometimes the shock takes the form of an economic crisis. Right. And this is what happened in the 1930s. You had the stock market crash in 1929 and then a big banking crisis. Right. Uh, it led to a greater than 20% 20, 20 unemployment rate, uh, you know, and a lot of economic um, uh, pain. And I think that was a shock that was sufficient to then create the New Deal coalition uh, led by Franklin Roosevelt that basically put in place the American welfare state. Yeah. Uh, in, in the period after the 1930s. That's the way a democracy, I think, is supposed to work, uh, uh, you know, where ordinary people are harmed by special interests and they mobilize and, you know, uh, under the proper leadership they change policy. Um, in 2007, 2008, we had a very big financial crisis, but the policy makers, I think, intervened fairly quickly and they put a floor under uh, the crisis and the unemployment rate really never rose above about 10 percent and now it's down to somewhere about five percent uh, and I think that you know the problem was that although that it's good that we didn't have a depression right. it wasn't enough of a shock to really force the big actors to rethink a lot of their policies yeah. 
Uh, and it's not clear to me what, what's going to cause that, because I, I do think that the kind of gridlock we have is, is going to be in place for, you know, for some time. Right. The, the, the current midterm election may worsen it for, for, for a short uh, period, may, for the, the may, next yeah. uh, phase, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, good. So let's um, uh, move on to the Chinese case. Mm -hmm. um, first, you know, I, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, I've, I've been reading your, uh, your studies, your books for many, many years. Um, you, you, you you are uh, a towering figure in political science. You made your name Yang. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a student of politics and mm -hmm. I've been reading. So since when did you take an active interest in China? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you, 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 you've devoted two chapters in this new volume. Mm -hmm. And the, in, the, in the first volume, there's a, a lot of uh, Chinese mm -hmm. analysis and Chinese content. Uh, and you've written about it. Uh, you're doing projects in China. So since when did you take an active interest in China and why? Well, I think I really started um, with the first volume of this book because um, it struck me that if you're going back over the whole history of world politics and where basic institutions came from, China is obviously an important part of that story. And what I argued in the first volume was that if you think about the modern state, meaning a bureaucratic, centralized, uh, meritocratic, uh, and impersonal state. A Bavarian state. Uh, a Bavarian, you know, what Max Weber described as a, as a modern state. Uh, it seemed to me that China, uh, among all world civilizations, was the one society that invented it first. And it really happened about 1,800 years before a similar kind of institution appeared in uh, Europe. Uh, but for various reasons, I think Western uh, historians have not credited China with this. Uh, and I think part of the reason for that is that in the West, a lot of the impressions that people had of traditional China came from the late years Reef. of the Qing dynasty, right. which was to begin not with... Not the prettiest moment. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a foreign dynasty, right. and it was also already in the period of decline yeah. in the 19th century. Uh, and you know they don't appreciate the, the character of Chinese government you know from a very early point beginning with the, the Qin unification in the third century uh, BC and it seems to me that that story was an important one uh, to tell and it's one that I think a lot of Chinese themselves have lost their, they've lost their connection with that history because of you know politics the basically yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so which brings up uh, the next point I want to discuss mm -hmm. um, you've said in in, in, in the book, mm -hmm. that the current Chinese governance system yes. is very much a continuation of dynastic China. I mean, of course, it's a, a modernized version, mm -hmm. uh, but, but nevertheless, a continuation in, in many essential aspects mm -hmm. um, uh, of, of, of China's long dynastic history. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's 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 an interesting point. I mean, mm -hmm. It's not being talked about very much, mm -hmm. even inside China. Mm -hmm. um, and regardless of the, you, you've said regardless of the intention of mm -hmm. those since Deng Xiaoping, mm -hmm. uh, they are actually recovering China's traditional state. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, many many I, mean, I I might argue that you know since the collapse of Chinese state at the beginning of the, at the, at the late nineteenth century, mm -hmm. the Chinese have been trying again and again to recover mm -hmm. that state. Um, so tell us about that, mm -hmm. how do you see it? Well, the traditional Chinese state was built around bureaucracy. Right. It was built around um, an educational system that trained people to take a civil service examination uh, in order to enter the bureaucracy. That was the main avenue of social mobility right. for poor people. Right. Uh, if you had a bright son, you could, you know, enter the Mandarin. And, meritocratic. Uh, it was meritocratic in that sense. Uh, it was centralized and it was impersonal in the sense that there's an aspiration that the Chinese government treats citizens as citizens and not on the basis of kinship ties or you know local uh, elite uh, you know connections. Right. So for example the central government uh, uh, would send representatives out to the provinces and make sure that that person had no marriage or kinship, you know, connections with, uh, with the locals because they wanted to administer things uh, impersonally, and I think that's the 
you know, that's the great tradition in China, and that's the um, the the thing that the Chinese, in a sense, invented, uh, which then other civilizations, including Western civilization, came to have. Uh, what China never developed, uh, I think, on the other side were uh, institutions of constraint, like the rule of law, or certainly anything like, you know, uh, electoral accountability yeah. that in the West uh, counterbalanced that state. Yeah, uh, which we will talk about. Um, yeah. But I think it's, uh, it, you know, what you're saying actually coincides uh, with a very interesting development in recent years, which is the CCP, the party, and its leadership, um, and the intellectual elites mm -hmm. uh, in China have been conspicuously mm -hmm. reviving the Confucian ethos uh, in Chinese society. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's almost unprecedented in, in recent memory. I mean, you've got Xi Jinping, the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, in numerous occasions uh, giving speeches mm -hmm. about China's traditional values and, and its tradition and, and saying that, that, that the current party and the current Chinese governance uh, is the inheritor of mm -hmm. that heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and do you see that uh, as connected to what, what your, your own analysis? Well, I or, think or are they becoming consciously <laughs> more consciously aware of what you, you pointed out earlier? You know, I think that um, that heritage was always there in, in it, it wasn't a consciously something that people were consciously imitating, right. but I think the tradition of stateness yeah. uh, was there not just in China, but in all of the surrounding Asian countries that were influenced by Chinese Confucianism. So that would include Korea, uh, Japan, yeah. uh, you know, one, uh, yeah. Vietnam. Uh, all of these countries have had this um, pre-modern uh, understanding of what it meant to have a centralized state, yeah. uh, state. And they also, I think very importantly, had a very strong sense of national identity that was built around common language, uh, I mean, in China, you know, a, a common literary language yeah. uh, that gave uh, the centralized state a great deal more coherence compared to, you know, really any other uh, part of the world. Yeah, yeah. So the idea of the state, mm -hmm. I think, is also in interesting. In the last, I think, 10, 15 years, you mm -hmm. have done a large body of work on that subject, mm -hmm. on the state, beginning with the book, I think it was called State Building, mm -hmm. a really well-written book. Um, and it's an interesting development. You know, for, for some time, maybe 25, 30 years ago, at, at some point people had thought the idea of a state was passe, mm -hmm. <laughs> or mm -hmm. the notion of state competency mm -hmm. was passe. Mm -hmm. um, but you have, among political scientists, you have sort of led the way in reviving the concept that the state was important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in this volume, you've also pointed out, further pointed out, that mm -hmm. a, a competent state a functioning state was a prerequisite mm -hmm. of political and national success. Mm -hmm. I mean, without which, I mean, you, you, we've seen a lot of situations where, especially Americans go in mm -hmm. and they institute different political, political systems, essentially electoral democracy, but they don't have a state yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the a, a competent state being at the center or mm -hmm. being a, at least a prerequisite of any kind of national political success. Mm -hmm. uh, would you elaborate on that? Well, I think you, it's hard to generalize across yeah. the West because in Europe they've got a much stronger tradition of state in France right. and Germany and, and yeah. places like that. But uh, Americans uh, are different because uh, democracy was always, uh, you know, critical to American identity, and Americans, I think, in many respects, uh, took the state for granted. Yeah. And uh, particularly after the rise of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, we went through a period where there's a dominant ideology that said that the, yeah, yeah. Was the, the state was uh, the enemy of, right. of free markets and right. individual freedom and, and so forth. And so the pendulum swung away from uh, thinking about the state to thinking that everything could be done simply as a matter of private enterprise and, right. and so forth. And I think you know this led to some policy mistakes, uh, both in the United States uh, and in you know the kind of advice that we gave to, to other countries. And many developing. But I think yeah. now the pendulum has begun to swing right. back because right. I think people have realized that that's, you know, that was a wrong balance. Yeah, yeah. And in, in many ways, I, I think the Chinese struggle mm -hmm. has been that. 
and, and, and it plays a defining role in the characteristics of Chinese state now, mm -hmm. which is that after the Qing Dynasty collapse, the so-called hundred years of hum century of humiliation, is the source of that s tremendous suffering. I mean, Chinese people suffered enormous, um, mm -hmm. enormously for for a long, long period of time. Uh, was perceived, I think, correctly as the the lack of any resemblance of a functioning state mm -hmm. <laughs> that could protect people, that could. Mm -hmm educate people or, or, or provide health, any of that stuff, where it right. defends its borders. That's right. You know, um, so I think that, that, that speaks to the, 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 the Chinese psyche. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and it, it accounts for a lot of issues that we also <laughs> that we have mm -hmm. today. You know? mm -hmm. um, so um, I think let's move on to, uh, we've, been, we've been talking about essentially chapter 25 mm -hmm. of your volume, and let's stay there for, for, for a little longer. You know, um, I think in that chapter, you talk about models of political governance, mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to, you know, the, the term democracy is perhaps one of the most misused and dis even abused terms mm -hmm. in, in politics. I mean, everybody claims he's running a democracy, mm -hmm. so, so the word's almost lost its meaning. Um, so, so we, but but what I found very interesting is that you classified, you made one particular classification of, of, of political systems. One you call upward accountability, mm -hmm. the other is downward mm -hmm. accountability. I mean, mm -hmm. realizing it's probably a continuum, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not binary, you know, yes. in, in, a, in an upwardly accountable system you have downward accountability elements and features and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and, but obviously, ha having said that, it seems to me that the electoral systems in America is, is a downward accountable, downward accountability, mm -hmm. uh, and the system in China is probably a more of an essentially an upward accountability, That's right. and, and throughout its, its history is, mm -hmm. is that way. Um, and now, it, it, it occurs to me, by reading your book, there are advantages in each, mm -hmm. and there are inherent risks mm -hmm. um, and, and in, in, in the DNA of each. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we talked about the, the risk in downward accountability, which is the, the vitocracy in Manzarellos and being captured by, by, by distributive coalitions mm -hmm. um, and, and ossification mm -hmm. that way, and political decay. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in upward uh, accountability, you have the issues of corruption, mm -hmm. patronage, and, and a slew of other, other things. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, let, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Well, so first of all, you have to say why accountability is important. Right. And I think um, the reason is that governments, if they're going to be just, have to serve not just the self-interest of the people running the government, they have to respond to the interests of the broad society. Uh, in the West, we feel that this can only come about through procedures like free and fair elections. But uh, you know, I think in China, there's a belief that you can serve the interests of the people even in the absence of these procedures, that the government can still be responsive to public pressures and, uh, and so forth. Uh, so there's an acceptance, I think, of the, the view that at least substantively governments need to be accountable. Uh, and the question is really, how do you achieve that accountability? And I think in the Chinese system, uh, you have a party uh, that defines uh, policies uh, by its view of what it thinks the society, the broad society, needs, and therefore, if you're a public official, a local official, uh, your main responsibility is, is upwards because okay. you don't face local elections where the citizens can directly influence what you say. Uh, I think the problem in China uh, is twofold. So one is just a problem of information. Okay. So one good thing about actually having local elections is that if people are unhappy, they've got an automatic way of registering that unhappiness, which is simply to vote you out of office uh, the next time. In an upwardly accountable system, uh, it depends on the people at the top of the system knowing what the citizens' preferences are. And uh, without elections, uh, they're dependent on uh, you know, developing other sources of information. And I think both in dynastic China and in modern China, right. that's a problem. It's right. just knowing what the people want and right. think and you know, are reacting because in a modern society, that's very dynamic and yeah. it changes very, very right. rapidly. 
I, I guess the point and the objective, regardless of whatever the system, the, the objective should be responsive governance. Mm -hmm. Somehow, whether it's upwardly accountable or downward accountable, you, you want to be able to be responsive in some fashion. Mm -hmm. um, now, in fact, actually, um, you know, in China, they've experimented it's no longer an experiment. Uh, village elections mm -hmm. uh, have been the norm for a generation now, mm -hmm. 20, 20, 30 years. Um, and most of the village heads are elected by, by voting. Yeah. Um, but looking back, I think the consensus is that it's been a failure. Uh, it's mired with corruption, ineffectiveness. Um, so you've cited Lily Tai. Uh, a young political scientist from Michigan or something? Uh, MIT. MIT, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and she studied village elections or, or village governance and she has cited informal mechanisms mm -hmm. for the party to collect response, uh, to collect data mm -hmm. and, and what the people are looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems that that's also an effective way by custom instead of a, a, a formal so mm -hmm. elections and mm -hmm. elections has been you know, has not really worked in, <laughs> at the village level. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are trying to figure out why. Um, I don't think there's a conclusion yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but but she has cited she has studied the, the, the in, a, 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 a large variety of informal ways of mm -hmm. collecting collecting data and responding to it, and has have said that that may be, that has been effective. Uh, it it depends, I guess, yeah. on your measure of effectiveness. Right, of course, uh, yeah. because. Um, I think you know one thing that sets China apart from other governments that don't have formal procedures like elections is that they do pay attention to public opinion. Right. And, you know they respond to social protest uh, not just with repression but right. with some degree of accommodation. Right. Uh, I guess the question you know down the road is, without more formal kinds of yeah. of procedures, uh, can you actually get sufficient information? So. This is why I think this is another area of continuity between dynastic China and modern China, because in dynastic China you had exactly this problem. Uh, you know, the Chinese Empire at the end of the Han Dynasty was roughly about the, the size of the Roman Empire, yeah. maybe 60 million people. It was really a gigantic yeah. political unit yeah, for, at that, the time, yeah. for that time. Uh, and especially with that kind of information, poor information technology, yeah. You know the uh, the leaders in in Luoyang or Chang'an, you know wherever the capital was, simply could not keep track of what right. was going on in the kingdom, yeah. uh, and they had to delegate power to local uh, prefectures yeah. or commanderies. Yeah. Uh, but then the local people sometimes didn't tell them what was going on, yeah. and so they had to pile right layers and layers, layers different of kind of agencies yes. to, 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 to make sure that they get yeah. the right data. Yeah. The, uh, it, yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, that, that, that happens mm -hmm. <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in many ways. The, uh, so, uh, of course, I mean, I think it's clear that the, the inherent risks in upward accountability system is, well, first of all, you need a good emperor, mm -hmm. <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. So, so the, 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 whether it's the emperor or the collective ruling body, the governing body, in, in, in our case, the party, Itself being healthy, mm -hmm. uh, with good intentions. Yes, I mean that that's a that's prerequisite, right. of course. And then with that prerequisite, the risks you face, the the challenges you face, is how do you collect data mm -hmm. from from the bottom mm -hmm. to ensure that upward it, It's it's a, it's the same risk a CEO faces in a company. That's right. <laughs> a, in a large company. That's right. How do I how do I make sure my department heads are mm -hmm. telling me? Mm -hmm. what the customers are telling him because mm -hmm. he's got an, an interest mm -hmm. in, in telling me good news, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I, so that, that's really, uh, it's interesting. Um, uh, and I yeah. think, you know, the one, so I think that's right, and the one difference with a private company yeah. is that it can go bankrupt. Right, So <laughs> a country if cannot afford to go bankrupt. Yeah. If yeah, the feedback mechanism. Now, so in a downward accountable, downwardly accountable system, what are the inherent risks and challenges that, that you need to be aware of and, and, and manage? Well, so I think they solved the information problem in a, in a very direct way. Uh, I think actually with appropriately decentralized government, the government can actually, because it's so much closer to the people, right. can actually uh, respond uh, much more quickly. So in America, for example, every single school district is really run by a local school right. board that's locally elected, and so it's the 
parents of the, the children that you know make the decisions on who the principal should be and, and, and this sort of thing. Uh, one problem with that kind of system is, um, you know, it, it can be actually local corruption because local governments can be captured by elites in, 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 in different localities. Uh, and then I think procedurally, sometimes, you know, the, even the fact that you have elections doesn't mean that you still don't, aren't affected by things like uh, money and so forth. But, you know, I have to say, uh, as an American, I yeah. still think that that's a better system yeah. because, yeah. Uh, you know, those procedures are really uh, important in making sure that the higher-up officials don't hide, yeah. uh, you know, misbehavior. Uh, and it, it depends on... I think the free flow of information as yeah. well. Yeah. So, I mean, aside from those risks, aside from these shortcomings uh, or interest groups and what have you, I guess one one other item is making decisions on a longer term or shorter term basis. Mm -hmm. um, and you you've talked about in in chapter twenty five about political autonomy. Mm -hmm. So, so a, a, a ruling body mm -hmm. that's somewhat or relatively autonomous of the different groups within the society mm -hmm. to, to capture or influence or hijack it. Mm -hmm. And and if, if that assuming that body is good, mm -hmm. is healthy, it's able to make decisions based on long term right. objectives and it's able to engineer and and implement those decisions without being bogged down by mm -hmm. by these mm -hmm. by these interest groups. And 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 I think that, that the Chinese success, to whatever extent you can characterize that mm -hmm. as a success in the last few decades, mm -hmm. um, was probably largely due to that. Well, you know, Aristotle made a distinction yeah. between uh, benevolent monarchy and right. tyranny. Right. And, uh, you know, he argues that a benevolent monarchy can make, you know, good decisions and act in the public interest, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, effectively. Right. Uh, I think that... Um, you know, the problem uh, is, as you said, this assumption that you had to have a good emperor to begin right. with. Right. Uh, and so I think, you know, beginning uh, with Deng Xiaoping, you know, you've had pretty good leadership in China. Uh, the Chinese system was able to change its economic basis uh, much more rapidly than a democracy would have been able to after 1978. Yeah. Uh, but the big problem is, how do you guarantee that right. you'll always have a good emperor? There's no guarantee. And you know, in a sense, the American or the Western system of procedural checks and balances means that, you know, on the upside, uh, it may prevent the, you know, the good emperor from really doing things quickly and, and uh, uh, decisively. But on the downside, it gives you some protection against yeah. bad emperors. And I yeah. think that's, you know, in the long run, yeah. very important. Yeah. The, uh, now, talking about good emperor and bad emperor, of course, it's, it's it's more, much more complex than having just a good guy or a bad guy. I mean, uh, I think in your in your book you pointed out, I, I think correctly that even in the long centuries of mm -hmm. imperial China, uh, with very few exceptions, the power of the emperor was greatly constrained. Mm -hmm. um, the, so, so I want to talk about constraints on mm -hmm. the power of the state now. Yes. So, so in fact absolute unchallenged personal power in in the history of in, in imperial China uh, was rare um, and they were constrained by bureaucracy they were constrained by moral codes by rituals uh, all sorts of rules um, and of course today China is led and governed by the CCP the party mm -hmm. and of course the party has 80 million members and it's a complex body. Mm -hmm. It has its own myriad rules and, and the ways, it, in many ways it's kind of opaque, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's hard to study. Um, so I think it's a very interesting point. point. So, so, so if you want to make predictions mm -hmm. about how long Chinese political system could keep producing good emperors, mm -hmm. uh, which mean, which really means how long can the party stay relatively healthy? I'm sure it's got a problem, the corruption is a big problem they're trying to fix, but could, on a net-net basis, how long can the party stay healthy to sustain the period of prosperity that we've been experiencing 
to date. Um, and, and, and I guess that, that would take a lot of study of the party itself mm -hmm. and, and the structures within the yeah, party. Because it depends a lot on individuals. And I mean, I think, so if there's a broad way of characterizing mm -hmm. Chinese government and how it's different from Western government, yeah. um, in China, there's been a much greater emphasis on morality and right. informal constraints rather than strong formal procedural constraints right. through law and through things like elections. Yeah. Uh, and that has advantages and, and uh, uh, disadvantages. Yeah. But the traditional system, I think, was ideologically more coherent than uh, the current one because you had a body of Confucian classics right. that was the basis for bureaucratic education and so forth. Today, I think there's some degree of confusion, confusion because on the one hand, the party is still Marxist-Leninist, right. but on the other hand, there's this desire to revive traditional right. Confucian values, right. and the two are not necessarily compatible with one yeah. another. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And well, that comes back to our earlier mm -hmm. discussion about the party's intention and, 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 and its work in reviving traditional values. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, in, in, you know, in many ways, if you really study the party, it, it, it functions very, very much like a, 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 in accordance to traditional Chinese traditional values, mm -hmm. uh, in the way they promote people, in the way they uh, they see their role. Um, obviously, there's not a uh, it's not the Soviet ideology anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's it's not about the Renaissance of the Chinese nation, which is a rallying cry for mm -hmm. the country. Um, and that adds, a, at least in the foreseeable future, mm -hmm. won't last forever, but at least in the foreseeable f future, that adds a weighty moral component uh, to its own self-image and its, its, its legitimacy in, in Chinese society. I think. Uh, it does, but I would say the, you know, the Marxist-Leninist component yeah. also emphasizes equality in right. a way that was never emphasized That's in right. traditional China. And there's been a big rise in inequality yeah. uh, because of the economic policies right. that the party uh, has uh, pursued in recent years, and that I think is, you know, a, a big uh, problem uh, for China yeah. because those two, you know, the contradiction. There yeah. is a contradiction. That's right. Um, the egalitarian uh, uh, desire, mm -hmm. um, but the e egalitarianism was a uh, was a big part of Confucian ethos as well. You know. I wouldn't say it was egalitarianism in economic terms. I mean, right. What it was was impersonality Mo of the state. And, and the, upward the, mobility. The state, yeah, the yeah. state permitted you know, some avenues for upward mobility and it tried to treat citizens on a fairly equal basis, yeah. but it permitted very large uh, discrepancies in wealth and social status. Yeah. And I think that that's something that, that communist China has been very you know, opposed to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So now let's move on to the concept of rule of law, or the, mm -hmm. or the, or the law. I mean, the second most abused term is probably rule of law. <laughs> Everybody claims that they want rule of law, but mm -hmm. they, they probably mean different things. Um, so I, we want to be careful with that, with that mm -hmm. term. Um, now, in, in the book, uh, you talk about the unique religious roots in European history mm -hmm. uh, in the development of the law mm -hmm. and, and the role of the law, um, which is very different from other parts of the country and other civilizations, especially China, of course. Uh, uh, could you, you talk about that? Well, actually, I think it's China that's the outlier. I think yeah. in, in right. Hindu India, in the Muslim world, right. in the Christian West, Religion in, began. in ancient Israel, yeah. in all of these different cultures, you had a tradition of law coming from outside the government. Right. Uh, the law was the domain of a religious hierarchy, and the rulers had to go to the religious authorities to get legitimacy and, and, and religious sanction. Uh, and I would say that China is the only world civilization that never had this kind of a religious right. hierarchy that stood outside of the power of the emperor. Right. Um, and in that respect, I think uh, China never really had a tradition of rule of law, it had rule by law, right. where law was seen as the commands of the emperor right. that was binding uniformly on the citizens, but the emperor himself was not subject to law. 
Uh, and that, I think, is, is the essence of the definition, my definition of the rule right. of law, that if the emperor is not subject to the law, then it's really not rule of yeah. So, but to talk a little bit more about the the, the religious aspects and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the cultural roots mm -hmm. of what you well, define as rule of law, because I think that would be new to. Uh, to the so, leaders. in the West, uh, the deepest political tradition uh, is actually a tradition of law. It's not a tradition of a centralized state, and certainly not of democracy, because that doesn't appear until two centuries ago. Right. But the law in the West really uh, arises out of the Catholic Church. Right. Catholic Church fights a big conflict with the Holy Roman Emperor in the 11th century uh, to bring forth uh, a revived Roman law that becomes the basis of the civil law traditions in Western Europe today, uh, which involves the ability of the Catholic Church to choose its own bishops and priests and to preside over this ecclesiastical law free from the interference of state power. And that means that all of European political development happens against a background where judges and lawyers have their own institutions right. that are not strictly under the control uh, of the state. Yeah. Uh, and I think that limits the power of the state right. uh, the, the, in the beginning. But, but in fact, actually, I think you, you did point out in the book, actually prevented the building of state in Europe for a long period of time. Well, it limited the kind of right. uh, absolutism. Yeah. Uh, and the only I don't know if you call it a fully European country, but the only place where this wasn't true was in Russia. Yeah, Eastern where Church. The Eastern Church remained completely under the control of political authority, and therefore it never served as a obstacle to the ambitions of, of uh, the czars. Right, well, I guess another unique aspect in the development of Western Europe was the collapse of the Western Empire, which left this enormous power vacuum mm -hmm. where the church, the Catholic Church, stepped in and That's was right. able to build these power bases mm -hmm. independent of the princes, because mm -hmm. the princes were weak. Mm -hmm. There's no imperial power. And, and mm -hmm. in Eastern, in Eastern, uh, in Orthodox sphere, mm -hmm. where that did not happen, That's uh, right. the state was strong and That's the religious right. authorities were subservient uh, uh, to, to political authority. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in the West, because of the total collapse, and the barbarians and, yes. and what have you, that the, the, the church's power was built. But, but the downside of that, of course, was the church's power uh, was very, uh, very invasive. It was very, uh, uh, in Italy, it prevented mm -hmm. the state in Italy from emerging for centuries until late 19th century. Well, no, I, <laughs> yeah, in a sense you could say that, but it also meant that it, it preserved a realm of freedom in Europe. Right. Uh, where, you know, ambitious, uh, monarchs couldn't do That's whatever right. they wanted. They right. couldn't just confiscate the property of their, right. uh, you know, their citizens. Right. In the case of Henry VIII, couldn't even divorce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's good. Um, so, now, um, how does, I guess the, uh, of course, Ch China's, China's tradition is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't have, I mean, China had a debate about, you know, the legalist approach and the Confucian approach and it was settled in the Han Dynasty and went mm -hmm. back and forth, of course, it, it had a lot of elements of the legalist mm -hmm. uh, ideas in, in its governance, yeah. uh, but the Confucian line was the main, main line, and, and of course, you know, uh, China never really had a god, mm -hmm. a Confucian, the Confucian religion uh, did not have supernatural aspirations, mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, so, so China does not have these the, the experience in this religious development and cultural development. Mm -hmm. um, and of course China is trying to build a governance system where the decision making is more rule based mm -hmm. um, and to improve legal governance, if I mean I, I, I want to avoid the term rule of law, so, so in, to improve legal governance. Mm -hmm. um, so how does, it's inter and, and, and the Chinese tradition as you pointed out in the book is contextual and situational, and it's, 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 it's immoral. More, more so than in the West. Right, it's a continuum, of mm -hmm. course. I mean, uh, um, and, and the European, European tradition is, is more abstract, mm -hmm. uh, a priori. You know, you, 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 you mm -hmm. decide in advance, uh, and it's generalized. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese moral tradition is contextual yes. and, and, and situational, mm -hmm. circumstantial. Um, so, so how do we, in, 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 a, in a country where its tradition is, is such, mm -hmm. um, how do you, I mean, 
I think I think over the, uh, its long history, China did have long periods where the rules were clear mm -hmm. and and well enforced, and and people felt that the society was just. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that's what they're trying to build. So mm -hmm. so so I guess my question is, with with different cultural and religious mm -hmm. traditions, um, what are how do you build a society mm -hmm. and, a, and a political system that have enough procedural mm -hmm. uh, checks, procedural mm -hmm. justice, but not so much that doesn't that it leads to what you, judicialization mm -hmm. of, of political governance? Well, I think in China's case, uh, the root to that is not religion; it's just rational self-interest. Right. Uh, I think that. Uh, what happened after 1978 is that the leadership in the party, uh, having gone through the Cultural Revolution, felt that their personal survival uh, was threatened by the depends absence of rules. rules. Yeah, it would depend on more. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And you know the reason that you had the emergence of collective leadership, you had a regularized um, uh, a system of term limits where the party leadership turns over every ten years. You had retirement. You know requirements. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. A lot of these rules were created because people thought that without rules, you you had just arbitrary. Mm -hmm. You know the possibility of just arbitrary dictatorship, and that was not a safe uh, situation. And I think in general, uh, people like to have clear rules. People yeah. like to know what to expect. Right. Can they keep their property? That's you right. know, are they going to be treated impersonally, or is someone going to favor you know somebody because they're a friend of the you know the person in power. Yeah, yeah. So I think that there's a, you know, a kind of um, universal need for a more rule-based uh, kind of decision-making. But I guess you don't want a society where the rules are so rigid and so ossified mm -hmm. that you can't move, uh, no, you can't right. reform. That's um, right. I mean, I guess that uh, reform and the law are Probably in contra contradiction to each other in well, some you respect. Need, you need, I, you I, need I, flexibility, right? right? I mean, in, in the U.S., you have eminent domain, mm -hmm. right? That means that the, the collective does have the right to take away a personal mm -hmm. property to mm -hmm. build a road somehow mm -hmm. if it determines for the collective good. So I guess it's a continuum. It's mm -hmm. not it's mm -hmm. not binary. One aspect uh, that troubles me uh, in in the book is that you talk about the law being independent of sovereignty, uh, of political sovereignty, um, and, and it w as a part of the Western tradition mm -hmm. um, and, and, and laws rolling in, in the West political development. But I, it, it, can really, it can't really be completely independent mm -hmm. of political sovereignty, right? For instance, the, the U.S. Constitution, uh, it can be amended. Uh, there's a political process mm -hmm. to amend the Constitution, so there is a sovereignty. Mm -hmm. A political sovereignty that's above the constitution, right? Uh, I think really, uh, in the American system, the people are sovereign. Right. Uh, they approve a constitution that becomes a fundamental law, and I think the real difference that we're talking about is that the constitutional level of law has to be approved by a supermajority of Americans. Right. It's very difficult uh, to amend it's it. It's very, but and and also to ratify it in the first place, it's not simply a majority vote. Right. Uh, whereas ordinary law usually can be passed simply by majorities right. and the sovereignty still rests in the people as expressed right. in their you know voting for a constitution uh, you know in the first place right but the political authority is within the sovereignty of, of the, the people. people and whatever it is That's right but the political sovereignty is above the, the, the law then I mean there is I mean, theoretically yeah, they, they create the yeah, yeah theoretically you could you could get rid of the Bill of Rights yeah, in that's the right. right. It's it's possible. No, I think in democratic yeah. uh, uh, theory. Uh, well, it's it's a complicated issue though because there's also a strand of thought that would maintain that there are certain, in a sense, absolute right. uh, natural law. You know, yeah. rules that also have to apply. This is what Abraham Lincoln argued that democracy and democratic sovereignty was not the only principle in American government, but the principle of equality in the Declaration of Independence was also an independent principle and that the people could not therefore vote to make certain other people slaves. Right. And this was really the issue that was argued well, between well, 
Lincoln yeah, but we don't. But there's no. But we don't know that. I mean, theoretically, you could, you could amend well, the Constitution. There is a process well, provided. That, but but Lincoln uh, argued that the Declaration of Independence uh, was also one of the founding documents of the country, right. uh, and was in a certain sense a higher principle than the Constitution right. itself. Yeah, but Lincoln actually suspended habeas corpus. <laughs> uh, well, no, that's right. I mean, I right. think that... So he exercised political authority above the law. Uh, yes, uh, but again, in alignment with, you know, this important uh, founding another, document. Another document, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it's very interesting. I mean, I, I, there, there's, it seems to me there's inherent contradiction. Of course, you got to, everything has inherent contradictions. Mm -hmm. um, good. Um, so I want to... Uh, uh, there are probably in in the book that this will this will scare people. Um, but you've alluded that essentially I mean, China is trying to develop a more legal environment, a more legal culture, uh, improve legal governance. Um, you've also alluded in the book that essentially lawyers are revolutionaries. <laughs> the lawyers uh, played a a, a very uh, decisive role in the French Revolution mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and within that tradition, uh, which is we talk about the, the, the law being independent mm -hmm. of public authority. But, but I guess there's another part of the Western tradition, uh, the English tradition, uh, uh, Edmund Burke, for instance, the Reflections on, on, on the Revolution in France. He spoke against that kind of doctrine mm -hmm. uh, about deciding things a priori. Mm -hmm. and generalizing a set of principles and rules that you have to follow. He spoke for a more organic development mm -hmm. where laws are in accordance to culture and, and customs. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I guess that the entire British Parliament rules only on custom, by custom. There's no law that gives them the power. Oh. I mean, the, the, the English Parliament rules by custom. Uh, that's not really true. No. I mean, they, they pass statutes and it has the effect of law, but... Right, but their ruling like, position was by custom. But people like Friedrich Hayek argued that the common law is basically judge-made law. It's very decentralized right. and judges react to local conditions, so it's not static. Right. Uh, it evolves, but it's also not something that uh, is necessarily planned by a sovereign single... Right, right, right. Yeah. Very good. Um, so, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, um, and I hope uh, it will enlighten a lot of people, a lot of our readers and, and viewers. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you.